part of what I enjoyed about Melbourne in the first few years I was here was that I was a little bit more anonymous. I've got away with not being recognised as much and just being part of the crowd because people just don't expect you there. She's flattered when she's recognised, but she certainly doesn't need it because I don't think the fame's important to her. It is a little scary sometimes. Someone can still go, oh, yeah, aren't you that girl on that pink boat? The one thing you just really don't get by looking at the, the chart is just how many miles there really are out here, you know, how far it really is. Jessica Watson's decision to attempt a solo and unassisted circumnavigation of the world at just 16 captured world headlines. Jess has never sought fame. It just found her, and she's had to learn from a very young age how to deal with it. This is the moment of complete jubilation. The world's changed for her after this voyage. Everything changed for her after that. An extraordinary day for Jessica Watson. I think there was a, a long period where I was trying to escape a little bit the past and the voyage and being solely remembered as that. What is it like to have a movie made about something so important that happened to you over a decade ago? Oh, it's surreal. It's so strange. I've seen it a few times, but it's still just a lot to take in. There's no doubt that with the movie coming out, that it will thrust just into the spotlight again. It's almost completely arrogant not to be excited about the fact that there's a movie being made about your life. <laughs> but there's such a sense of, oh gosh, <laughs> what am I getting myself into? Here we go again. I feel like I've had enough fuss made of me to last 50 lifetimes, but I'm gonna give it a go. Being on the water and, and the ocean, it's just so much a part of me and, and I've, I've lent on it and used it kind of really, really heavily. Being on it or near it is just the, the only way, I suppose, to just really feel uh, OK. <laughs> it's been a really difficult period for Jess. It's been really hard to watch, actually. She's coping as best as she can under very, very difficult circumstances. In those really, really tough moments, it was leaning on the people closest to me that were really holding me up. Cam was Jess's partner of 10 years. Cam and Jess raced as part of the crew on PP1, which is a racing yacht sailing out of Sandroom Yacht Club in Port Phillip. So one go main, hold angle, hold angle. Now. About a year and a half ago, Jess lost Cam in a really unexpected way. Cam had a stroke. Had, I had no idea that something like that would happen to someone at 29 years of age. Uh, go hard downwind, downwind, all the way downwind. I had no idea what the depths of pain and grief could could be like, and how how bad. How bad that could be. Jessica has managed to tap into an inner strength, and I think a lot of those mechanisms have come from her around the world voyage, which taught her how to overcome adversity. She's always managed to find a way to navigate through the difficult times in her life. Jess is the second of the four children. The kids were all born on the Gold Coast. They had a very outdoor childhood. We did a lot of camping, a lot of four-wheel driving. We were always going somewhere on the weekends. We actually sort of learnt to sail as a family. In my early years sailing, I was terrified a lot of the time. I was really scared. Someone at the sailing club suggested that we should buy a boat and go North. So we thought, oh, that's a good idea. We went on to live on the boat for many years, sort of travelling around a while and, and doing homeschool. 
it was obviously planting ideas and, and helping us realise that there are other ways to, to do life. <laughs> Jess's dyslexia was a problem for her schooling, but I didn't want that to define her either. You know, that I wanted other things in her life that she's good at. And I read her a lot of books. And it was one particular book, Jessie Martin's story, Lionheart, that really did all the damage. So Jessie sailed solo, non-stop and unassisted around the world as an 18-year-old. Man, this swell is awesome, you know, it's just What I learned from my trip was that it started with a dream and it, that dream gets encouraged. And then if it does, you just don't know where it will end up. He was relatable for me. And that just gave me this connection between, he's a normal guy, he did that, I'm normal, maybe I could do something like that. I must have been 12, so I didn't ask my parents. It was kind of telling them that I wanted to be the youngest person to sail solo, non-stop, and unassisted around the world. She must have been bloody brave to put that out there, you know. But you know, over the next year, when she started putting stuff in place, you know, like, this is serious. I'm an adventurer and I enjoy supporting other young adventurers to get out there and have a go because life is all about inspiration. We had a fantastic conversation and I really detected something very special, that she was not your typical 15-year-old, but very focused, very determined and very real. But it was pretty clear that without a boat, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't until Don actually said, OK, all right, I'm buying you the boat, that things started really coming together. Yeah, so the boat was about five and a half tonnes, so she's moving five and a half tonnes. I met Jess, this little skinny 15-year-old girl, about five foot nothing, <laughs> but was going to sail around the world in a pink boat. And immediately, I was like everybody else, thinking, what? That's just crazy. Phrase, uh, Andrew, really helped the, the project gain some kind of professional support and sponsorship and kick-started it. Can you do it? Can you be the youngest around the world? I find that a bit of an annoying question because I wouldn't be here if I, if I wasn't, if I didn't have every confidence that I can do this. Everything was looking pretty good. The boat was prepared and Jessica set out on her first sea trial down to Sydney. Love you. Go back for lunch. <laughs> See ya. So the first night out to sea, I went to get some sleep. There should have been alarms that would have alerted me to ships nearby. They didn't go off. It was a whole series of things that went wrong. You know, the, the movie shows this sort of slightly simplified version of events where I forgot to set an alarm, which is, you know, there was definitely some user error <laughs> on my behalf. I woke up to the horrendous noise of being scraped down the side of a ship. I stuck my head up, you know, in time to sort of see the, the wall of steel that was a, a ship's hull. Stuck my head straight back downstairs, put my hands over my head and, you know, heard the, the mast snap. It's not the way her dream run was supposed to end, but 16-year-old Jessica Watson was trying to stay positive. I got told, get on a plane to the Cold Coast and you'll need to deal with the media. There was an incident just before 2am last night where Jess was hit by a rather large cargo ship, in fact, 63,000 tonnes. Facing up to, to those cameras and that media scrum and the aftermath of that is, is absolutely something I still draw strength from, to sort of have gotten through that. That's all right, really, I'm OK, <laughs> but <laughs> lost half my mask. And from that moment forward, everything changed. It had gone from being this low-profile voyage to all of a sudden Jessica Watson was a household name, but for all the wrong reasons. Premier Bly has urged solo adventurer Jessica Watson to rethink her voyage around the world. It was 
extraordinary the level of criticism. I would receive emails saying, if you let this girl go, you've got blood on your hands. Both state and federal authorities are investigating if there is a way to stop the teenager from sailing after a damning maritime safety report. As horrific and embarrassing as it was, all the preparation sort of kicked in and that really gave me the confidence to go, in the worst situations, I'm going to be able to hold myself together and do what I need to. Have a lovely time. Don't forget to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's ambition was to sail solo, non stop, and unassisted all the way around the world. It was a unique track to head up into uh, the Northern Hemisphere and back down underneath Cape Horn and then across the uh, South Atlantic to underneath Africa and then across the Indian Ocean all the way back uh, underneath Australia back to Sydney. It's about 23,000 nautical miles and it's quite a feat because you cannot stop for any more supplies. You've got all your own food, water, medical supplies, safety gear, everything. Yeah, so uh, I've just been keeping busy with uh, tons of little stuff, keeping the boat happy, keeping me happy. The plan was that I'd be writing blogs ideally daily as well as video blogging when possible so people could follow along and be part of the journey as well. The first leg was pretty beautiful sailing through the, the Pacific, so through the tropics. Sailing along really slowly, not much going on. Just that sense of how beautiful it is to be under the power of sail and alone in that environment. Just lots of blue water out there, so it's pretty cool. She checked in twice a day uh, on the satellite phone, so usually a morning and night. So it's uh, traditional to have a, a dump in the salt water as you go across. Here you go. Sometimes I could set the boat up and she'd sail for weeks on end without me really having to do anything. Hey, just cooking dinner at the moment and uh, tonight we're having a tin pie. So I'd be reading, writing my blogs, chatting to friends on the satellite phone and very, very rarely doing a little bit of schoolwork. Christmas morning and uh, I'm having a foggy one out here, which is pretty cool. And uh, I just uh, treated myself to washing my hair and then ran the heater for 15 minutes. The challenges in themselves are immense and the biggest one is the psychological challenge. You know, to complete a voyage like this is a real mind game. 370 nautical miles from Cape Horn and we're just sitting here going nowhere, we're becalmed again. Just flopping around, it's just really starting to get to me again today. It's, it's just driving me crazy. We're so close to the Cape and we're way down here and we should be having lots of wind and we should be making great progress and we're stuck rolling about going nowhere. I think that's probably where she shed the most tears, uh, which was when there was no wind, ironically enough. Here we go, we've got Cape Horn just uh, poking out through the clouds. Uh, looks absolutely amazing. Cape Horn is, you know, they, they call it the Everest of sailing. If she could get round Cape Horn, she, she could get round the world. Well, how about this? I'm done. I'm uh, round Cape Horn. Think, lady, this is the Cessna with Mum and Dad in here. We're only a few minutes away from you, so you should be able to see us very soon. Are you okay? I'll uh, come up and uh, see if I can spot you over. Oh, no. <laughs> Mum and Dad were able to fly over out from Cape Horn, which was, which was awesome. There she is. Here they go again, nice and close. Wow, you can hear the engines. <laughs> It was all and everything that I ever thought it was because it really impressed upon you how small that boat is in that bloody huge ocean. 
Bye, Jesse. Love you, Hoops. Love you, Dad. I love you to trip back. Over. See you, darling. After Cape Horn, it was into the South Atlantic Ocean where we struck a really nasty storm. This was the one that was really dangerous. The waves were between 70 and 100 foot, and pretty soon Jess had experienced five knockdowns. A knockdown is when the mast uh, goes beyond the horizontal and into the water. The rogue wave picked up the whole boat and knocked it well underwater. never forget when the EPIRB went off. It's the emergency beacon when it goes off, it means that the boat's at least three metres underwater. And we had no contact with Jessica for a period of time. And everybody was like completely speechless. It was so stressful. Like, there's just no way she would have set off an EPIRB unless she thought that was the end, you know? And I just thought, this is the end. It was a period, a couple of hours maybe, where I was contemplating whether whether this was it. I think she's the only one that will ever know how bad those five hours were during that storm. I really like to just go to sleep for like eight hours instead of half an hour or an hour until the next alarm wakes me up and there it goes now. See, I didn't even get five minutes. By the time Jess was sailing back into Australian waters, I think that's when her fame really started to build. Talk about something completely different. Out on the deep blue sea, it's time to catch up with Jessica Watson. It was everywhere. It was front page of all the newspapers. And all of a sudden, we started to realise, wow, this thing is going to be huge. I'm going to miss it so much out here. It's just so beautiful and it's so simple. It's just... Mm, lovely. From Sydney to Sydney, by the world, the teenage girl in her little pink boat has made it. She'd sailed almost 24,000 miles for seven months, across some of the most treacherous oceans on the planet, and sailing back into Sydney to an incredible homecoming. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Jessica Watson home. Jessica was only 16, three days before her 17th birthday. She did what she promised to do. Her life has changed forever by her achievement. I don't think people realise how overwhelming it was because after a long period away from land, everything feels close and the sensations and the smells and the, the noises and the colours, all of these things are really, really vivid and overwhelming. <laughs> when she stepped off the boat, it was just, you've made it, <laughs> yeah, you've made it, yeah. Yes. In the eyes of all Australians, you now stand tall as our newest Australian hero. I'm actually going to disagree with what our Prime Minister has just said. I don't consider... I don't consider myself a hero. I'm an ordinary girl who believed in a dream. You don't have to be someone special or anything special to achieve something amazing. You've just got to have a dream, believe in it, and work hard. Well, weren't worried, but um, yeah, I think I've become the youngest person to sail. Traditional sailing uh, family. It was... And I was also going to do it in the safest possible way. The couple of years after the voyage were just crazy. So many amazing, exciting things. She had no choice but to grow up very quickly. And that's a challenge for a 16, 17-year-old girl to have to constantly deal with public adoration and media virtually on a daily basis for the next two years after she returned from the voyage. And the winner of Young Australian of the Year is Jessica Watson.
Very soon afterwards, the, the book I wrote about the voyage was published, so that led to book tours around the world. I got involved with the United Nations World Food Program and uh, Dancing with the Stars. There's something that I maybe um, shouldn't have done, because I'm certainly not a natural dancer. It didn't take long for Jess to ring me up and say, I'm doing a, a, another project. And I said, oh, here we go. What's this one? Jessica Watson is heading back to the ocean as skipper of the youngest crew ever to compete in the city to Hobart yacht race. All right, guys, you ready for a hoist? That's where she met Cam. So far, those on board say Jessica isn't too bossy. She doesn't yell at me like other skippers, so, no, nah, it's good. Cam was one of the people that was told, you know, he'd be great, has great experience. And the first time I talked to him, I just remember thinking, hmm, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> There was definitely a little bit, oh, who's this? He thinks he's all right. And of course, the first time I met him, I was just needing to pretend that I wasn't totally like, wow, who is this? Um, and trying to play it cool. But there was something special there right from the, the start. Boats continue to pour into Hobart. We came second in our division in that race, a result that we're really proud of. Around the world sailor Jessica Watson and her teenage crew arrived to a big reception. Cam and Jess had become very, very close. And when things became romantic, I don't think anyone was surprised. Cam and Jess were together for 10 years from, from 2011. They loved to take the Cape 31 just out on Port Phillip and sail that around together. And they planned to do that kind of thing forever. I think I realised how much I also really enjoyed being able to just slip into the role of, of Cam's girlfriend because it was a way to kind of step away from everything else and maybe almost hide behind him a little bit too, and I really enjoyed that. Jess moving to Melbourne, being with Cam, was virtually the start of, of a new normal life. And she's worked really hard to get to where she is now. You know, she's done an MBA, she's got a good career path now. Oh, this is a beautiful space. So these days I'm a, I'm a manager in, in Deloitte's human capital consulting team. So that's essentially management consulting. Been a good week. Big go live, pretty smooth. Being dyslexic probably made me more determined and, and learn to have to kind of work around or overcome challenges. But I think there's something in there about just that sort of slightly different way of thinking. Your projects are a lot shorter these days, aren't they, Jenny? They are, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Occasionally I get someone who's just so confused about what that sailor girl is doing in this office, you know, in this really corporate environment. It's the sort of story movies are made of. Now Jessica Watson's is destined for the big screen. Now a whole new generation will have the chance to share the journey all over again. Phrase is the one that's just really incredibly persistently been determined to see the, the story turned into a movie. Oh, stop! Pre-production on True Spirit, the Netflix movie, started on the Gold Coast in June 2021, and Jessica and Cam were up there working as technical consultants on the film to make sure we got all the sailing components exactly right. Cam was very excited about the film being made. I think he was very excited for the story to be told. Cam was what you call a average, healthy 29-year-old male with no underlying health conditions that anyone knew of. Cam had no idea that he had high blood pressure. Completely out of the blue, he started feeling really unwell all of a sudden and, and symptoms that obviously we quite quickly worked out that were symptoms of a, of a stroke. Took him straight to hospital. Um, and the first advice was that it was a minor bleed, actually, in, in the brain, but it's going to be OK. Um, and then, of course, it, it wasn't because um, the, he had the second stroke, which was, which was catastrophic. After the second stroke, you know, we spent weeks and weeks in hospital. I think it was nearly six weeks. You know, that time was utterly traumatic, but, you know, at the same time, talking to him about every single memory and going through both of our phones full of, you know, 10 years of photos and memories. And I like to think poor every tiny bit of love, you know, into him that I, that I could. For a while, sort of desperately hoping that he, he might recover, but 
realising along the way and that that, that wasn't going to be the case. He was 29 when he passed away, just shy of his 30th birthday. It's brutal. It's a, it's a tragedy. That's the only word I can think of to describe it. I don't think anyone knows or will know how Jess got through it. And he's still going through it, by the way. I think it took a, a long time to really sink in. It took a very long time to really hit me. I really learned how, how bad and how scary, I suppose, your head can, can get. To sort of realise there's nothing you can do, nowhere you can go, and you can't avoid it. I thought I'd been through some pretty intense things um, and faced a lot, but I was completely sort of cocooned in all this amazing support. But at the same time, I was definitely really, really struggling and not wanting to be here without Cam, really. It's, it's, it's that simple. It's, it's just so bad that you want the pain to stop. Yeah. I've certainly learned with, with grief, tell people what you need. Don't leave them to guess. She did all the right things and she got help and the crew of PP1 have definitely, like, gotten around her and supported her. Since Cam's passed away, the one thing that I was always sure of is that he would always want us to keep sailing. There you go. There you go. Don't hold it. I suppose if you wanted to kind of design the perfect sort of way to cope with grief, this would probably be it. Out in the salt water, out in the wind and waves, Going sailing almost feels like a way of celebrating him. It just feels like really doing, doing something right by Cam. I don't really know what the future holds beyond doing things that feel purposeful and meaningful, and that's doing as much as I can for, for organisations like the Stroke Foundation, helping people remember to check their blood pressure. Um, I really, really feel so motivated and you know, excited about those things. Hey, hello. <laughs> Look at you. Nice pink shirt. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Good. Ready to roll? Ready as we'll ever be. With the film coming out now, it was the last thing I think on her mind to be talking publicly again. You are on the grief journey. No, it's a year and a half um, now, and, and of course all of this has so many layers of emotion and it's, it's absolutely honouring Cam to sort of try and enjoy this as much as possible. Look at me, I'm the one that's crying. But, oh, <laughs> I'm keeping the makeup intact for now, but um, <laughs> that's, that's coming later, um, no doubt. <laughs> it's odd, but maybe I don't have the energy to be awkward about being in the spotlight. It just sort of is what it is at this point. Perfect, cool. Hands ready for this camera. Ready, three, two, one. Great, cool, keep smiling. I'm having fun with this, and that's obviously something that I've, I've learned to such an extent, you know, since Cam's passing, um, and he, he wanted me to have fun with this. Oh, it's just the best, you know? <laughs> you get to have all the fun and all the trouble without any of the responsibilities, so have fun. I'm 29, and I suppose I just have this sense of um, having lived a, a lot a lot of absolute, you know, terrible, you know, things and, and so much pain, but also, you know, there's so much that's extraordinary and, um, yeah, a lot. Do you want to have a quieter life? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, no. I suppose I hope that I keep throwing myself into it. <laughs>